Hey everyone, good morning. Yes, still slightly morning, I guess. Uh, my name is Jimmy. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at @jbogard. It's still mostly untapped tweets at this point, I think. Um, you can find this presentation and pretty much everything I do on my GitHub. Same thing, github.com slash jbogard. And uh, I also blog quite a bit. Well, I guess not as much as I used to. I'm a website at jimmybogard.com and there's some other, other junk about me at the bottom there. So this presentation is a story in two parts. Um, I had the opportunity to work with two fairly large projects about three or four years apart in almost the exact same domain. And this presentation is about some lessons learned building a, two large systems using domain-driven design concepts and the lessons we learned from the first system and all the things we did wrong on the first system and then how we applied those ideas and the lessons learned to the new system. So I first want to set up a little bit about the, the background of the project, uh, the majestic monolith we created. Has anyone heard this term before, the majestic monolith? Oh, no, <laughs> just a few of you. <laughs> okay, uh, so the, uh, right about the time when uh, microservices, the term, the, the idea of microservices was coming around, um, a lot of what they were talking about in microservices were things that microservices were not. One of the things that microservices were not were these really big, large applications that you'd have one system that ran the entire uh, enterprise. Uh, does anyone have a, a system like that that has over 1,000 tables in it? Yes, you poor souls, you. Um, so, so he kind of railed against that, uh, DHH, the creator of Rails, um, and said, you know, it's okay to build these really big systems. Uh, not because it's actually that good, it's mainly because uh, Rails can't really break down things into smaller systems. So he said, yeah, we, we want to do that. Uh, and we'll call it the majestic monolith. And so that's what we built in the first part of this, uh, of this uh, our first project, was this, this really large single system for everything. Now, just a little bit of the background of this project. Um, the, like a lot of projects that we work with, um, we're usually taking over from someone that completely screwed up the process. Um, and so the previous company that we're working with, uh, they were intended to build a juvenile justice system for the entire state of Texas. Uh, so this previous company w spent uh, one year building requirements documents. Uh, they were stacked about, about this high, I think. Uh, the funny thing is when we got to those documents, most of them, when you got to the details of the stories, you all said, to be elaborated on post-elaboration. Uh, so it's just basically placeholder documents for everything. That's what we had to work with. Uh, there was zero software to show for it. They built nothing other than thousands of pages of Word documents. Um, and so we were hired on to build this new system uh, in hopefully an agile fashion. So this is actually the first agile project for a Texas government agency. Uh, and is also the first domain-driven design project for any kind of t Texas government agency. And the overall goal of the system was uh, every single county in the state of Texas, which uh, I guess our population is around 30 million or so. I have no idea, just made that up. Sounds close enough. Um, every single large county in Texas has their own uh, IT department and their own systems they built over the years. So you have very large cities like, like Dallas and Houston and Austin and Fort Worth, which is like 20 miles away from Dallas, uh, and San Antonio's another. They have their own individual systems that they built over the years. Um, but then everyone else had their own system that was provided for them, provided to them by the, uh, by the state of Texas. Um, and I believe it was like a Fox Pro app or something like that. Really, really old and crusty. So the idea is that they have got all these different systems and none of these systems talk to each other. So if a kid got in trouble, and this is again for juveniles, so it's for kids that got in trouble. If a kid got in trouble in one city and then went somewhere else and got in trouble again, um, the people that were trying to get that kid on the right path had no idea what had happened before. There was no visibility to anything else that was going on. So the idea was that we'd build one system that everyone would use so that we'd have one place to go to, we can see in the entire history of uh, the juvenile. Now, the people that were involved in the project were like, they're very, very caring about this. So for them, when they said it was all about the kids, like they actually meant it. It wasn't just a thing they, they said. Um, a lot of them were probation officers, which means they actually worked with the kids to try to uh, get them back on the straight path and, and not go into the adult system, which meant that they would go to jail and things like that. So some of the goals we had, um, we wanted to increase knowledge sharing between the different counties. Uh, and we wanted to, the next thing we want to do is uh, each of those counties had probably a dozen other systems internally. So we said, right, we're not only going to replace 
uh, all the systems in the state of Texas, every county is just going to have one system that covers the entire legal process for a juvenile. Um, we'd also be able to get a complete picture of what's going on with that kid, like just absolutely everything that was going on with the legal process, uh, everything from when they did something wrong to they went uh, potentially went to, well, they didn't call it jail. They had like kid-friendly names like detention instead of jail, things like that. So we'd be able to see the everything uh, as part of that juvenile. Um, I got a picture of it. This is the entire <laughs> this is the entire legal process uh, for juvenile. Actually, no, that's not true. Um, right in the first color there, there's some arrows going down. So it's really only the bottom flow that deals with juveniles. Uh, but it was a very uh, large amount of things that was going uh, as part of that. So the idea was we're going to build a system that covered all those colors just on the bottom uh, from start to finish. One system to do absolutely everything. Now this was the, you know, this is our, our first agile, uh, big agile project for the, for the state. So we wanted to do it by the book uh, and actually legally by the book. So we were contractually obligated to do a lot of the like uh, agile things. Like we got paid in sprints, that sort of thing, which was funny when uh, holiday time came and they didn't want to pay us for the week we're going to be gone. Oops. Uh, so we went to, we got together. What's, what's one of the first things you do in an agile project? You got to build user stories, right? User story, that's what you got to do. Um, and as part of those user stories, there's the as a blank. And that's a persona, right? So we had to go through all of these, these paths on the bottom and figure out what are all the personas we're going to build for this system, all the different users. Well, <laughs> the cracks are already starting to show at this point because we, in our first pass of defining the personas, we had uh, 72 different ones of these. And we got those really large post-it notes to write them on, and we put them on the board, and the board kept going, and we had to move offices because the board couldn't contain all the post-it notes. Uh, we could have gotten smaller post-it notes, I guess, but then you'd have to go like walk up to the, to the thing to, to read everything. So he said, right, we can't figure this out. This is way too many of these things. Uh, so let's color code them uh, based on the agencies. Um, this was kind of our first clue that maybe we had too many things going on. Is if we have to color code the personas in our system, something's wrong. Does anyone have those like uh, they've uh, one of those big plotter machines where they've printed out the entire schema of their database, and you had to color code that thing too because there's too much stuff going on? Yeah, I know you have. I know you have. So that's what we had to do here. We could. There's so many people involved in the system doing so many different things. We had started having a, a color code legend to figure out what was going on. Uh, so that was our first lesson. Um, Everyone kind of skips the last part of the Domain Driven Design book where it talks about strategic design and bounded context. Well, we stopped before we got to that point when we read the book. We did all the, uh, the other stuff, which is like entities and aggregates and repositories and stuff like that. Uh, so this, this is a screen of a drop-down list for a menu of a, of a specific juvenile. And these are all the different top-level areas you can deal with when dealing with that kid. And behind the scenes, each one of those is at the very least a group inside of a company. Sometimes it's an entire agency, a legal agency in the state of Texas. And, it, and you could just do absolutely everything as part of this. <coughs> so looking at this list, there's just no way that we could satisfy all these different groups. Um, the product owners themselves, they were actually very, uh, they were an expert in just one of those menu items. And they kind of knew about the other things, but not really. So we were able to do one of these sections really, really well. And the other ones were like, well, we don't really know what's going on. So we'll just kind of put some CRUD screens up there and call it a day. Now, one of, the, one of the other things they wanted to do as part of this was uh, be able to track these kids over time. And the other thing they wanted to do make, was, was make sure that there was no data duplication in the system. And the idea that if I have someone's name twice in the system somewhere, that means I've duplicated data, and so it's, it's bad. So they meant they have these like, really generic entities in their system. Uh, when we got down to like looking at everything that was in there, we finally got to the core concept, which was a person. But a person really didn't mean anything to anyone. It was just a human being, but when, when the respects of the legal system, there's no concept of a person in the legal system. It all has to deal with these uh, other legal, uh, legal entities. There's other problems with this, this sort of model when you have a person being everything in the system um, because uh, it, it's feasible for a kid to get in trouble be entered in the system as a juvenile. Juvenile inherits from person, naturally. Uh, and then they, uh, over time, they, 
they right their wrongs, they go on the good path, they go to school, they go, they go to graduate school, they go to law school, and they become a lawyer, and now they want to represent kids in the state of Texas because, hey, they, they were set in the right path, so now they want to they wanna repay that favor. Unfortunately, they still show up in our system as a juvenile. So <laughs> we can't even represent this, this idea of, like, the good path for a person actually can't be represented in a system because everything has to be this, uh, this common person thing. So it got even worse, too, when we were having to do with uh, requirements around uh, the integrity and the visibility of the data. If you're a kid and you get in trouble and uh, your record is wiped clean, we're supposed to wipe out the records from the database. But if that kid comes back again as an adult, as like a brother of someone or a father of someone, we have this like, uh-oh, we, we have this like blank father name because there's still this, this core person concept. So that was the next big lesson for us that we... Uh, one of the, f the first big things of domain-driven design is you're supposed to be able to build this ubiquitous language. But a person means nothing to anyone. So for ubiquitous language, it has to mean something for everyone. And if it can't mean something for everyone, your system is too big. This became even more clear when we were trying to understand uh, for a given model what it meant for different uh, agencies that we were dealing with. So the four kind of big agencies we dealt with were the law enforcement agency, prosecution, courts, and the juvenile probation department. The yellow box was, a, was our product owners, and they hated everyone else. So we talked to the law enforcement uh, agencies and said, okay, what's, what's, the more, the, what's the core critical concept that you deal with on a daily basis? It's busting perps, right? Offenses and arrests. That's the most important thing for them on a daily, the forms they fill out, the, uh, all, the, all the things they track are all around offenses and arrests. We talked to the courts and said, okay, what's the most important thing for you? Well, it's the trial, the trial process. Uh, hearings, the court calendar, things like that, uh, that's the most important thing to them. The prosecution agency, it was about the cases they were uh, taking to court. I literally, when we would go visit them, they had folders on their desk. Those folders represented a case they were trying. And finally, the JPD, Juvenile Preparation Department, these, these were the people that was all about the kids. So for them, the most important thing was that kid. Get the kid on the straight and narrow path. Get him out of uh, uh, trouble. If they're in a bad place, get him out of the bad place into a good place. It was all about the kids. Everyone else was just like a number on a forum that was the kid. They didn't care about anything else. So similar to the ubiquitous language needing ubiquity, uh, the core domain also needs consensus. If everyone you talk to can't agree what the most important domain models are in your system, that's a sign that you have too many systems trying to compete together. It got even worse. So we would, uh, we would model a specific concept like uh, an offense. An offense is kind of an important thing. That's something you did wrong and it uh, corresponds to some legal code in the system. So we asked each of the agencies again, okay, we have this, we, we kind of had this thing called an offense and everyone agrees that this is a term we should, uh, we should, we should focus around. So what, what is an offense to you? For the law enforcement agency, it's form CR-23J. That's an offense. The form they fill out in quadruplicate, I guess there's like four carbon, carbon copies they have to really press hard on to make sure it goes all the way through. That's what an offense is to them. The courts, an offense is something to adjudicate, something that needs a disposition, a disposition meaning an outcome. Either the outcome is uh, they're found guilty, and I think there was a more kid-friendly name. They're like, I don't know, some, some other kid-friendly name for, for guilty uh, or not guilty. Um, so that's something they, they just needed an outcome for. Prosecution, it was something to charge them for. So I'm charging you for an offense. It may not be the same offense, though, that was filled out on the law enforcement uh, form because they may plea it down. They may say, well, the, the, the police said they did this, but actually uh, they were just caught uh, doing this, but they were actually, uh, they all actually stole a car and committed a lot of other crimes. So we need to put all these things together uh, and maybe that ups or lowers the, the actual offense we're charging for. So that's what they're concerned about. And the probation department and offense is something to just move past because it's all about the kids. We don't want them to go to jail. We want them to live a nice, happy life. <coughs> so the, the lesson number four for us here was that the ubiquitous language itself needed consensus about what it meant. If I take a term 
to each different person, and they don't agree about what that term means. Now, it's okay to say like details, but if you, if you can't get everyone in a room and have them agree what, the, what, term, what that term means, then again, I'm building a system that's trying to satisfy way too many people, and I'm never going to make everyone happy. Now, I will admit that there are a lot of times that I come into organizations and they don't have ubiquitous language, and that's okay, but part of that process is getting them to agree. When you say a word, it means X. When you say another word, it means Y. And let's not confuse you two. In fact, a lot of times I'll even correct the domain experts and the product owners when they say uh, X. I'm, no, 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 actually, you should mean Y uh, because we want to make sure that we're using the same terms for the same uh, meanings. But if you can't get everyone to agree, then there's no way you're going to make a system that's actually going to solve everyone's problem. Now, probably the most egregious thing we did was uh, going pattern happy on all those different domain driven design patterns, like the, the, dom the domain objects, the aggregates. We, we argued endlessly, endlessly, endlessly about what was the right way of doing things. Uh, what was the right uh, base aggregate object? What was the right repository? And so we built things like, like this. This is one of the repositories that uh, I, I helped create. I helped create this mess myself. Uh, and so one of the things we had was like, uh, for repositories, there are a couple, couple different competing patterns out there. You had generic repositories. It's so like iRepository of T, where T could be any domain object type. Or you had domain specific repositories. So you'd add IT repository, like this one is iOffense repository. And then on this repository, you throw all the different query and command kind of things you put, could possibly do in this one single place. Now, we were also building like ridiculously layered architectures. So we had this rule that said the domain can't reference the ORM directly. We had to have this abstraction. So this was an abstraction over the ORM. Um, and because the ORM is complicated, we had to create all these very specific methods for different, uh, different querying needs. Otherwise, it, it would perform horribly. So this was really the worst of every single kind of repository pattern because none of the individual patterns we had would satisfy all of the data access goals that we had. And at the end of the project, we took a step back and said, you know what, actually those structural things, the entities, the aggregates, repositories, those are by far the least important aspects of domain-driven design. And in fact, uh, Eric Evans had a presentation, something like domain-driven design 10 years later, uh, and in it, he said uh, that he, had he, if he could do the book over again, he would have taken everything past the first section, which was the ubiquitous language part, starting with the discussion on entities and aggregates, all the way out to that bounded context stuff. So he would take all that out, stick it at the end of the book as at most an appendix, if not just remove it completely. Because those structural patterns are the things that we as developers focus on, but in terms of building a successful system, they're by far the least important part. So I took this uh, snapshot, I guess, I don't know, about six months ago, just to see where it wound up. Uh, it's one of the bigger MVC applications I've seen out there. This is not an accomplishment, by the way. You should be proud of numbers like this. This means it's way too big. Uh, close to 200 controllers, 650 actions. We had 120, 121 roles roles being those personas. We, we had a problem where we had 72 personas, but you needed like combinations of people because a uh, small West Texas town only has three people working there. So they have to have like 20, 20 different roles each. So we started creating these bubble up aggregate roles. Got 121 of them. 218 entities, 184 value objects for whatever that means. 352 enums and about 50 counties deployed. Now for that, that, last, uh, that last entry, I think is important because we actually shipped and went to production, and it's still being actively developed and deployed today. So although it wasn't the nicest picture at the end with all the stuff that was going on, uh, we, are, we were able to ship on time and on-ish budget uh, to most of the counties that needed it in the state of Texas. So I was happy about that. So the, the picture that was painted for us in building these really big domain-driven design uh, projects was this like beautiful city where everything's connected together, everyone's happy, uh, there's no crime and things like that. But the reality was more like District 9 where it was really just like a ramshackle town of duct tape and bailing wire, everything stapled together. So we left that project, we felt, we felt reasonably good about it, but we got to the end and said, you know what, if we could do things differently, we would. Well, we got that opportunity with a do-over. Now the do-over wasn't like a real do-over, so we didn't get to replace the existing application. That's crazy, it's good, it was working. 
But what we got to do is build a new system. Remember the top part was the, the juvenile and the adult? So we got to build the adult system. Now, uh, just like the previous one, they tried to go with uh, someone else to build the adult system. And in the adult system, they tried to build another giant monolith. It failed after about a year and a half because you remember the thickness of those lines. That actually represented the complexity of those two systems. So as big as the juvenile system was, the adult system was way more complex and just impossible to build uh, as a single system. So because it was too expensive slash costly slash risky to build a single system, instead what we would do is, well, we, they ran out of money. So that was one other thing that happened is trying to use the money that was left. Like, well, we, we can't afford to build another failed system. So let's just build one system and just say, let's, let's just do that one. So I wish I could say that it was intentional, some of the design decisions here, but uh, it really had to do with like politics and, you know, golf course decisions, things like that. Um, <laughs> lawsuits too, it turns out. Uh, so instead, we're gonna focus on just one agency at a time. Uh, we're gonna and start with uh, the prosecution agency. So in this picture, it's that uh, this blue section, and by the way, we should have really known from the previous thing, like if this, if the way the state thinks about it are in these very hard boundaries between different agencies, that's a clue that maybe we shouldn't build something that tries to connect everything together in one single system. Uh, but we were a bit naive. Oh, also as the contract told us to, so we kind of needed the money as a company too to build this system. But this one, no, we're gonna do it differently. We're gonna build one system just for the prosecution department uh, and that's it. This new system was gonna be built around different bounded contexts. So the prosecution system was only gonna be dealing with the things the prosecution had to deal with and then any other kind of people that were dealing with it because there were, other, there were other companies or other agencies, those would be something to the outside. And then we'd figure out sometime in the future how to integrate all these different pieces. So uh, initially going into this, I was very, very proud of the system I helped build and the, uh, the juvenile side. And so I was excited to go talk to the users of the juvenile system because the adult prosecutors also prosecuted juvenile cases. And so it's kind of neat, hey, let's go talk to the people that are actually using the system I built. We had heard from the probation department and they loved it because it was built just for them. So let's talk to someone else. So I went up to uh, the district attorney and said, oh, by the way, I was the architect in that last, the juvenile project. And this is his literal response to me. <laughs> Which is a bit of shocker when you build something you're really proud of and then someone just like craps on it right to your face. You're like, wow, you're blunt. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so he said, okay, we can't, we can't use the same concepts we had from the previous system. So let's just start from scratch. Let's just throw everything we knew about the juvenile system and say, what would it look like if we built a system that was just dedicated for you? And we had him like take him out to drinks and stuff, get him to like us again, because he was the one that ultimately had to check off on the stories we developed. So it was important for, him, for, uh, for us to build the right system for him. And so what this wound up looking is way, way different than we would have envisioned how we just gone with the juvenile system. So if you remember before I said uh, every single agency had something they were very focused on, what was the most important thing? And for the prosecution agencies, they were concerned about cases. That's what they did all day long. Uh, this is pretty obvious to us after the fact, um, going through this process, that they don't care about the juveniles, they care about the cases, because they try cases. Cases can include one or more people as part of it, and they really want to care about that case. So everything in the user interface was built around um, built around cases. This one, for example, looks like that I, uh, I stole a rail car, it looks like. That's what I did. Oh, by the way, we would be really careful in this system because uh, as we were demoing features, we had things like the, you know, we're using like Simpsons and Seinfeld characters to demo, like uh, Marge Sisson murdered Bart and Lisa and then did something else with Homer. And we thought that was all funny. And then we demoed that and sometimes the people will like have a tear in their eye, literally because they had a case that was just like that. They're like, oh, let's just stick with silly, silly things like I stole a rail car and that won't make anyone upset. <coughs> so when we reduced the boundary just to that one single agency that made the core domain very cohesive, it means it had a lot, everything inside of it was very uh, close to each other and then from that we were able to build an even more interesting system. So this idea that if I, I remove a lot of other options and I put myself on rails, that I can go a lot farther than I could if I tried to just expand out the scope of what I was dealing with. 
If I just dealt with cases, we can build a much more interesting system for the prosecution agencies than what they had before. We also, have, we also revisit a lot of the un uh, core underlying model concepts. When we rolled out the previous system, we had hard-coded roles in the system. So the idea that you're a law enforcement officer had hard-coded permissions associated with it. With our new system, we switched that up. We said the, the users and the roles are the things that are really dynamic because those smaller counties, those smaller systems in different places have a lot fewer people and so they don't have the, compli the complexity of the roles that we have. But the things that are hard-coded are over here on the permission side. Those are the only things that are really hard-coded in the system. Everything else is dynamic. The minute we can build very granular task-oriented permissions. Previously, we were uh, authorizing by roles. So we would say, are you this role? Okay, you can do this operation. Instead, we build permissions around individual tasks and kept it dynamic about how we associated those task-based permissions to the different roles we'd have in the system. That meant that our controller actions became uh, very obvious about what they were uh, dealing with. So every single controller action typically had one permission associated with it. And because this permission was defined in one place, I could do things like, if I'm going to show a link on the page, check to see if that user has permission. They don't have permission, just don't show the link. If they can't perform that action, don't show the button. If they can't see this section, they don't have permission to show that section, then just hide that tab from them completely. I can only really do, really do this if I am enforcing and defining my permission in this one place. So that was our second lesson when we were building these kinds of systems. Uh, originally, we wanted to be uh, like super, super dynamic. Uh, and it turns out if we made things, uh, made things rigid in some places, made some base assumptions, then that allowed us to have a much more, uh, uh, much more uh, cohesive model going forward. Now, I was talking to a team yesterday about their entity attribute value <laughs> system. <laughs> and so I've seen these kind of like metadata driven systems that let you do whatever you want. But the problem with the systems that let you do whatever you want is the system you wind up building is not that, uh, can't really do that many interesting things. But in this case, by us uh, providing some rigidity, we can say we can really take those concepts and run with them and build you a much better system in the end. When we first went out to visit the different counties, we, we asked them, you know, what, what is the most important problem that you're dealing with on a daily basis? And we two counties that, interestingly enough, were right next to each other, Dallas and Fort Worth, and said they had the exact same problem, the file ma a file management problem. When we went to Fort Worth County, their problem was digital media evidence. So all the police cars and other like, convenience stores and things like that have either CCTV or dash cams, although they have like a button to turn it off if, if they're about to beat someone up, I think. Um, and that those cameras and those, that those recordings become evidence that they want to then use in the court. But that, beca that becomes a, a big issue for them because they're taking all these recordings from all these different places and they need to keep that evidence for a long time, like 10, 15 years, I think, something like that. And so their problem was just how do we deal with this mountain of data that we're dealing with we had to be able to get and retrieve very quickly. So he said, okay, that's a very interesting problem. I'd love to solve that one. Let's go to Dallas and see what their file management problem was. So he said, uh, after uh, taking a tour, we said, okay, so show me your file management problem. That's their file management problem. The roof had a leak, and it was leaking on top of their paper folders that kept all of their cases. This county was 100% paper-based, and so the, all the problems you would have with paper, they were seeing. Like, literally, if someone lost a case physically, the case could not go to trial. And they'd have this fire alarm about once every two weeks, where like the entire, the entire floor would stop and go look for this case. Because they need to go to court by like two o'clock and if they don't make it, then it could be dismissed. And so everyone's scurrying around like, I thought John had it, I thought that Mary had it. And like, oh, someone put it in their briefcase and took it home. So they had these really complicated check-in, check-out procedures on a piece of paper again to make sure they could uh, figure out where everything was. Unless the roof leaked and destroyed a whole box of cases and then they were screwed. I'd even be walking down the, the hallway and sometimes I'd have to stand sideways because floor to ceiling were boxes of old, of old cases. They had originally stored all the cases in the basement, but it flooded during a heavy rain, so they had to move them up. So it was just like literally in the hallways of everywhere. 
So given these two places, we knew like we can't build a single system that has such widely varying, uh, widely varying problems in terms of the business processes they have. So we knew we couldn't make everyone adhere to the exact same business process, but we wanted a system that did guide them through their business processes. A lot of systems I deal with have uh, their core entities have notes. And the notes section, which is just a giant text field, that's where the actual business process has. Does anyone have that right now? Where you have like dates and initials and someone writes something, and that's the actual business process, that swivel chain integrate. We wanted to build a system that was, able, that was actually able to model those different processes for each, uh, for each individual county. So we built, uh, we built a workflow system, a rather simple one, that had different statuses for different entities. So you could have like uh, an open case, uh, adjudicating case, uh, a closed case, and then you can define different transitions based on those different uh, workflow statuses. Uh, we also had different roles associated with those transitions so that only specific people could perform specific transitions. And if there was a custom action associated with it, we could uh, have, a cus uh, have a specific action for that specific transition. Now what this allowed us to do is, one, we didn't have to buy some expensive off-the-shelf workflow product because those things are a beast to configure and it seems like we just spend all of our time trying to configure the thing. So we built something that was just tailored to their needs. And the other nice thing about it is we could drive all the work of the different uh, agencies similar to how you might use Jira, where Jira has these filtered queues. And in fact, uh, you have to be careful if your product owners use Jira a lot They'll want your system to be Jira. You have to be really careful of that. So that's kind of what happened here is that they have different filtered views for different cases because they might uh, have a thousand different cases that are active at one given time. So I need to have some way to help those cases be driven, uh, driven through a process. Now this didn't exist anywhere on the pieces of paper around each different system. Like there was no, there was no workflow document anywhere in the existing, inter in, in existing counties. So e sometimes we saw that the business process model needed a model associated with it. And by building that model around the core model, that meant that I can build workflows and business processes that could be represented explicitly in our system and have those end users actually define how they want the cases to go through the system uh, and not force any one county to have the exact same process as anyone else. i say the last one, uh, this next one is one of the ones I was more proud of, uh, which was us ditching all of those domain-driven design patterns. So we wanted, what we wound up doing was uh, going through a very, uh, a very long soul-searching <laughs> journey, saying we went to the logical extreme of all these different crazy DDD patterns. Uh, we got to the end and said, you know what, what we saw at the end wasn't any good. It was not easy to maintain, it was, it was uh, not easy to understand, not easy to test, not easy to, not easy to maintain, it was just too crazy. So what we wind up doing is going through a series of defactoring steps, which means removing all of those patterns and just putting everything in the controller action. Like you're not supposed to, right? You're not supposed to do that. And then we took a step back and said, right, now that we've got, <laughs> now that we've unpatterned everything and unabstracted everything, let's take another step back and say, what are the overall true patterns that we're, that we're actually seeing here? And it turns out that the overall patterns we had were some very simple request responses. So every time I would make a get, a query, I would turn a result. Conversely, if I wanted to change something with a post, that was going to perform an action and return a result, like success, failure, or something like that. So instead of us modeling around these, these abstractions, we modeled around the true, uh, the true concepts that were happening in our system, which were queries and commands. And we want to I wound up building a library to help me do this called Mediator, which is able to send a request to a handler and then return a result. And then a controller actions become this very thin looking thing. And in fact, I don't know uh, exactly what MVC adds in this scenario. Um, I might even choose something like Nancy uh, to help make this a little bit cleaner as well. In any case, the actual code behind the scenes for every, any one action was instead pushed down into an individual handler that did the actual work. And in the work inside of here, you'll notice that I'm using all of the abstractions or all the actual uh, third-party tools directly. In this case, we were still using an Hibernate, just had to, 
um, and uh, a DI container. And instead of us like putting those behind some weird abstraction, we said, just forget it. Let's, let's just use those things directly. And only when we have a problem with that, only when we see code smells or test smells, then we can go ahead and abstract those. Now, what are some of the reasons why we might abstract these ORMs? Like, you might ditch your ORM. You might switch it someday, right? Has anyone actually done that, switched ORMs? I have. But I've only been able to do that by not abstracting the ORM. And in fact, one of the systems I work with, we switched from uh, Entity Framework to and Hibernate to Petapoco, Dapper, and then back to Entity Framework again. When you do things like that, by the way, you get really good at regular expressions. Uh, so uh, we were only able to do those kind of piecemeal refactorings if I didn't have this one single abstraction that everything went through. If everything went through this one core abstraction like a repository that, put, that had this pinch point that made, uh, made a very hard coupling between all the things that were using it. In this case, um, I'm using an ORM, so I'm coupled through there, but if I want to switch out what this is doing for something else, like let's say I wanted to use a different ORM altogether, like Dapper, that was just, I wanted to just go straight SQL base and just go like that. Well, that only affects this one individual handler and nothing else. If I'm building those abstractions that couple together all my entire system through a, a rigid layer, uh, I'm, not able, I'm not able to do these uh, more complicated refactorings to take my system to the next level. So we said, right, just make this the dumbest code possible. Whatever you need to do, just stick it in here. And if you need to refactor this and to do something else, you can, but that refactor needs to be just scoped to this one individual handler and not trying to be push, pushed out into any kind of common objects at all. The most we would do to push down common behavior would be for our domain objects for posts. For posts, we would still funnel that request down to the domain object to do its work, um, and then the handler would be pretty thin. Uh, but for the most part, we just said, screw it, just put everything inside the handler and anything you change will just be related to that one individual piece. So that was our fourth lesson. Just in general, not fo blindly following any pattern advice. Unless the advice is to use CQRS, then you should blindly follow that one. Oh yeah, CQRS is lovely. <coughs> not to be confused with event sourcing, that is a totally separate orthogonal concept, right? Yes. Okay, so the last lesson we had was we've moved away from this one single system to deal with everyone possible, but we still have to deal with those other people in the future. So if I'm needing to deal with others, I've got my own, uh, my own service boundary here that just deals with prosecution cases. And inside of that, we do have smaller services that are, are dealing with internal parts. Those in internal parts aren't exposed to the outside world directly. So internally, we have cases, Dockets, which is the complicated way you Tetris up a court calendar to put different cases in different slots that have different lengths of time and things like that. Grand jury is a, its, whole, its whole beast altogether. And finally, our workflow pieces. These are all those internal services and the overall prosecution system. But we had to deal with other people. So for each group we had to deal with, for, the, for that group, we would at that point in time decide, based on your needs, we'll build something specific that is dedicated to what you need. This is opposed to us building some like generic REST API and being like, oh, here's some, here's some REST API. Uh, used to be OData, now it's GraphQL, but it's still the same kind of thing. And we'll just expose it out and you can just do whatever you want. We didn't do that. We want to look at each individual third party and say, what is the appropriate way that you need to integrate with us? And based on the the existing interactions between those two, uh, those two entities, that's the decision, uh, that's, the, that's the, the way we made our decision. So for example, law enforcement agency. The law enforcement agents uh, have a interesting relationship with the prosecution, and it's a very close-knit relationship uh, between those two because prosecution needs to get its, its cases from law enforcement agency, but the law enforcement agents' systems are like beyond old and beyond crusty. Uh, in fact, if the law enforcement agencies, like they don't, they don't want to do paperwork, with that paperwork, but that's pretty much what they do all day long. And so we looked at what, are their, cur what their current process was, and what they wind up doing was, uh, every day, uh, about twice a day or so, they'd come with a giant stack of cases of arrests, said, okay, these are the, these are the arrests for today, and just boom, here's a giant stack of uh, papers. 
And so they'd hand off a very specific contract, a message to the prosecution agency, which was one of those forms that was filled out in quadruple quintuplicate that they had for the form dash 23 CRJ or whatever I had before. So we wanted to emulate that same kind of thing that says, right, you come in and you uh, give them these cases. So what we'll do is we'll create a page that has everything you need on it laid out exactly as you have it on your paper form. And you can just come in and just type it all up as you see it. Um, we couldn't use OCR because they had horrible handwriting and that wasn't going to work. So they had to type it in themselves. Um, and to encourage this use, before they had like seven, uh, seven different uh, windows in which they could come and, and uh, drop off cases. And what we wound up doing was is limiting the, the paper cases to just one window and made all the other windows computers. So if they wanted to drop off paper ones, they could, but they'd have to wait in a very long line. So it was just a little bit of encouragement to so like use, the, use this other system. But we built an entire application for them inside the prosecution boundary just for this one single purpose. Now the defense attorneys were a little bit different. They needed more information than just, I'm going to give you a, a form and walk away. Uh, they were involved in the entire life cycle of the legal process, so we needed to build something a little bit more, uh, a little bit more complicated and, and comprehensive for them. So what we wound up doing for them is building them their own individual portal outside of ours and building a specific REST API just for that portal's purpose. So the defense attorneys, they could be dealing with different counties because they could live on the border of Dallas and Fort Worth. So this portal was also able to talk to multiple different APIs. And to make sure that we, uh, and to make sure that we could upgrade the system well over time, uh, we actually used actual REST hypermedia for their API to make sure we had a good decoupling of the client and the server there. But again, that was an API purpose-built for, uh, for that portal, which means the security, the shape of the API was dedicated just for what, those, uh, what the, portal, the defense portal needed. It eventually, we dealt with indigent defense, which are defense attorneys appointed by the state to represent you. Uh, they had their own completely different system with some other communication means. Uh, and the same thing with courts. The courts had a completely different system as well that uh, used, I think, just a variety of integration protocols to talk to uh, our core prosecution system. So our big lesson here is by building these, uh, building these individual little portals between our system and theirs, we were able to shield our core system from the needs of everyone else. And then we didn't just take uh, our connection string and hand it out like I see a lot of times people do, or just throw a REST API on top of their database and call it a day. We wanted to build very specific integration points for each of these different cases to make sure that we gave them the exact thing they needed and what they needed would not bleed into what anyone else might have. So that was that last section in the book that we totally skipped because there weren't any pictures in it and the text was really small and we just gave up. But that dealt with micro, before it was called microservices, the concept of microservices and building anti-corruption layers, these translation layers between our system and others so that we could continue to grow our system independent of other people's needs. So this system, its final tally, it was still a fairly large system. Um, 70 controllers down from, what was it, 200 or so from the previous one. It had a whole lot of actions, but that's because this new system was able to be more Ajaxy, more dynamic, so there's a lot more uh, fine-grained API calls for the uh, client app. Uh, lots of permissions to do all the different things. Uh, far fewer entities, 139 versus 200 and something. Uh, but still a good deal because it was, it was again, just, uh, just dealing with the prosecution system. Uh, we had 80, uh, zero value objects. Uh, I forgot to tell the story there. We got rid of our value objects because they weren't supported by uh, the database. And if the database doesn't support that concept, the data structures you're looking for out of the box, it makes it super hard to deal with that. So we said, let's not go against the grain here. Uh, we're not going to try to uh, do that sort of modeling. We had 80 enumerations. And then at the, I guess, close of last year, we had 30 counties deployed using our prosecution system. And this time, like everyone was actually happy. I don't have the video, but uh, in, in one of the counties we deployed, we did a demo. They like literally stood up and clapped for us, cheering because they, they had, this is going to be such a better system than our old paper file-based system before. 
And that other guy that said our, our system was a piece of crap, he actually kind of begrudgingly said, okay, it's all right, it's all right. Like, okay, that's, that's good enough, that's a win. So everyone remember, remember this picture uh, uh, floating on the internet? There's the JavaScript definitive guide and then the good parts and like, <laughs> the good parts are way, way smaller than the actual one. Uh, well, the same thing we saw with uh, domain-driven design. There's a domain-driven design book, and the good parts are actually all the parts dealing with the concepts around microservices. So it turns out if you just read the microservices book, you'll get all the things you need from the domain-driven design book without all that cruft of all the junk that doesn't really matter to us. So that was domain-driven design, the good parts. Uh, I'm Jimmy Bogart. This presentation is up on my GitHub, uh, and we have some time for questions. No one disagrees with the repository thing? I'm sure someone does. Yes? So the question was, why did I, re why did I go back to Entity Framework uh, to begin with? Um, that's a great question. So we went from Entity Framework to an Hibernate, which was way more complicated, uh, to Petapoca, which is one of those micro ORMs, and then finally we went back to Entity Framework. Um, well, it turns out, uh, Entity Framework lets you work in two kind of modes. It wor lets you work in an entity-based mode, which is great for writes. When I say, give me this entity by ID, and I have this, this complicated graph that I can pull out and I can deal with. Uh, for reads, it's not so great. I mean, you can use it right, but it's pretty inefficient. You have to do the dot include and all that sort of stuff like that. But Entity Framework does let you drop down directly into SQL. So there's a way for you just throw any random SQL at it, get a DTO back out, and call it a day. So I said, right, um, I don't want to have two ORMs in our system, like one dapper and one, uh, the micro ORMs, which I think suck for writes. They're not that great for those situations. Um, and then we, ha we have uh, Entity Framework for writes and then dapper for reads. That one's going to be kind of awkward as well. So we said, forget it. Let's just use Entity Framework. And when it's not performing well for reads, we can still use it dropping down into the SQL-based version. It's still not that great, but it's like the least crappy option. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. You can find me later if you want to argue about repositories. Otherwise, have a great rest of the conference. Thank you.